Look, I, you know, I, I think in this case, the statement that we released is pretty apropos. You know, I think it was the highest of the highs, uh, you know, our little piece of immortality by winning Champions League. Uh, and then it was uh, a pretty low, low missing the playoffs for the first time. And, um, you know, we had uh, we had a, a one month issue last year um, where we finished effectively 03 and 04. We had a three month issue this year. Uh, because we were very good until uh, through July 2nd. And we were playing uh, post uh, CCL even, we were playing at the second highest points per game pace in, in MLS. Uh, and it was so, you know, we, we got to, we won the game in Toronto and then the wheels came off. And, and uh, uh, July, August, September, we're obviously not up to our standard. So uh, we got to figure out uh, why that is and make sure that it's not a pattern. And, and uh, you know, we'll continue to, uh, work on that. And I think, you know, the general tenor that has already been captured is we have a lot of guys under contract. Um, so we have a lot of our, our team intact. Um, you guys will probably be shocked to hear me say that I believe in the talent of the group. Um, you know, I, I groups don't get untalented from, uh, you know, uh, you know, four months or five months in the beginning to three months at the back. So uh, they can be inconsistent and we have to again, have to address uh, the the source of that inconsistency. Um, but uh, the talent level really doesn't fluctuate, certainly not of an entire group uh, that much. And uh, one injury to JP certainly had an impact without question, just as the injuries to Jordan and, and Nico had an impact the year before. Uh, but uh, with all those guys in theory back and, and uh, at 100 percent, hopefully uh, it bodes well for next year. Uh, and again, I think that uh, one of the positives at the end of the season was we continued to have pretty good performances from some young, young players. Uh, and I think we enter next season with the most possibility. We, we finished this year. We, we were still fourth from bottom in, in youth player minutes. Um, and that was that was still a little disappointing. Um, but, you know, if you look at the amount now of young talent that has come in and, and established itself, uh, Jackson Reagan, Danny Leva, Obed Vargas, Dan, Josh Atencio, um, you know, I think those guys, it's it's tough to argue with any of them. Um, and certainly in smaller sample sizes, I think Ethan Doubler did some good things. Uh, Dylan Tevez didn't play a lot of minutes, but scored a goal uh, in the opportunity that he got. Um, and and uh, Leo Chu, I think, is another one that might benefit from some more time. And, you know, we'll see if uh, how that one uh, lands. But, uh, you know, we're going to keep working and we have a bunch of possibilities, we think, for how to reshape the team. Uh, but going into an offseason with no DP spots, I wouldn't expect uh, radical change. And, and in part, philosophically, we don't believe that uh, radical change is, is needed. Um, that, now, that's not to say there'll be no change. That That's not the case. And we've already had part ways with one uh, really special veteran uh, in Will Bruin. And uh, I just want to use this time to say thank you to Will. Um, he's a really special person, a uh, really special family. Uh, it's really been an honor to have him in the group. Uh, for a number of years. And, and uh, you know, we just thought that by uh, by making this move now as early as possible in the cycle, it maximized his chances of getting to another team uh, without uh, anything uh, needed for us. So um, we felt like this was in his best interest. I'm sure it's probably hard to see that big picture right now, if you will. Uh, but we just really enjoyed having him on our team. He was a huge part of us for a long time and uh, really grateful for his contributions to the club and, and uh, to the to the several championships that we won, several finals that we played in uh, with him as part of our squad. Uh, so with that, I will uh, shut it down and uh, we'll open it up for questions. As you heard Gar say, we'll uh, take all questions as they come in. We've got plenty of time today. As a reminder, if you have one, please hit that raise hand function button so we can get to everyone and your follow-ups. Nico Moreno, you've been waiting patiently. I saw you first. Please go ahead. Uh, well, Garth, I wanted to touch on two things you kind of hit on. I mean, the success wasn't just CCL, but these young players that are coming in, how well Tacoma Defiance um, has played and, and, and the players that are in that team. Uh, but I wanted to ask you, what, what has worked? I mean, you've invested money, you've invested time. What has worked uh, kind of to build that to where it is now? And what is your expectation of that continuing to be that successful? Look, you know, I think I, we try to use objective metrics for this stuff, right? Nico, it's great to say, oh, I like this player or, you know, we're, we're doing a great job and pat yourself on the back. But 
you know, in that space, we have in the last five years, we won the national championship, uh, U-17. We won back-to-back -back GA Cups in 19 and 22. Uh, and, you know, we've promoted a whole bunch of staff. Uh, you know, John Hutchinson uh, went over to coach in Japan, you know, head coach at El Paso this year. Uh, Chris Little, uh, one of the top uh, assistant coaches with Colorado. Uh, Mark Nichols, uh, now with the, I believe, the technical director with Columbus Crew. Um, and look, we were, we've were we been fortunate. And this is where being the Sounders really helps um, because the culture and the brand speaks for itself. And, you know, we were able to replace uh, Mark with uh, uh, Henry Bronner, who is, I think, arguably the best developer of talent in the country. Uh, he's amazing. Um, and uh, Hutch with Wade Weber. Uh, and Wade led us to uh, the Western Conference final in his first year in charge. And I think is a just a cultural uh, signpost for our organization, just, just a, a pillar, uh, somebody who's just critical on and off the field to everything we stand for. So uh, what I would say, Nico, and answer your question is I'm, I'm very happy with the direction of our development. I think we continue to get better. I think we continue to produce players. Um, you know, uh, I, 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 well, I can't remember if we've announced it yet or not, but you, we're going to have one or two signings off out of that uh, defiance group into the first team for the for next season. Um, won't necessarily be right away, um, but that is coming. And uh you know, so we we continue to be excited about our pipeline of talent, um, and we continue to uh, be excited about Steve Cook's work uh, with the academy uh, and you know what they're capable of and and uh, the kind of players that they're developing for us long term as well. Because I think there's some real talent uh, that it, that is uh, you're going to guys are going to see coming through in the next cycle of uh, defiance players as well. And the second thing you touched on should be brief. I just wanted to ask: there's been times where you guys uh, have allowed players to go look at other offers. Uh, Will Bruin being that person, if there was to be a, a, a chance for him to be back, is that, that door still open? Look, the door is open for Will in the sense that we're never going to kick him out and leave him in the street. But I think, you know, when we look at our salary cap situation, we look at 23 signed players. Um, that's a position where we might go out and target another player. Um, you know, there just might not be a lot left, you know, uh, and, and we always try to be respectful of these guys as well. I understand you can bring guys, guys back on pay cuts, um, but it's not always a good idea. And, and you got to think of the culture of your locker room. And again, you have to have the respect for your veteran players to say, hey, what I might have or what I think we're going to have is not what you're worth. And, and if you can't promise something, then then you better not. Uh, you know, kind of leave them hanging around. So, so I don't, you know, no. So to be clear, the door is not closed on Will Bruin, uh, but I am not optimistic that we're going to have the resources required uh, to give him a fair offer uh, going forward. And that's why we've, we've told him and given him the freedom to explore other opportunities. Thank you, Garth. All right. Next up, I see Jeremiah O'Shan. Jeremiah, go ahead and ask your question. Uh, I guess, uh, one of the players that was left, um, or I guess two of the players that were left a little bit in limbo with today's announcement were uh, Sam Denneran and Freddie Montero. Uh, I guess with Montero, it sounds like maybe a similar situation to last year where you were continuing to negotiate with him. Um, but is there any more light you can shed on the uh, Denneran situation? Yeah, look, we haven't had Sam with us for a couple of months, right? So some of this is he's in a playoff chase with San Antonio. Uh, and so we don't want to be disruptive to them or to him. Um, so we have spoken to Sam's uh, representation, um, you know, and what I would say is, you know, those conversations are ongoing and you know, look, Sam's done really well. He's got, uh, I believe, 25 goals now in USL in the last couple of years. Um, I believe he was the leading scorer on San Antonio who finished as the top team in the USL league. So, you know, to me, he's a player uh, that definitely has value. Um, and, you know, if you made me decide today, Jeremiah, we would take his option. What's not clear yet is what is the best role for Sam? Um, you know, and I think as we go forward too, with a number of young players that we have, um, you are going to see us make more use of loans. You know, certainly what I, I would say that the, the Sam Adinron move to San Antonio was successful for both sides. It helped Sam improve. It gave him more experience um, and it drove up his market value. So those are uh, situations that you may see us employ more frequently uh, with our young players going forward. 
All right, next question we'll go over to Jade Evans. Go ahead. Thanks, thanks, Garth. Um, in talking to Nico, uh, one of the games um, toward the end of the season, he had mentioned uh, mistakes made kind of top to bottom or things to look at top to bottom. So how uh, has that kind of maybe been addressed if you agree with him or if he had mentioned that or, you know, how have some of the errors or missteps maybe uh, have been addressed uh, this season? Sure. No, and look, we met with Nico, we met with all our players after the season. And so we got feedback, uh, you know, from Nico and for everybody else. And obviously Nico's our captain. So uh, we give special weight to that one. And look, what I, what I think he was referring to broadly speaking is, you know, when you make, and you've heard me refer to this off and on Jada, uh, when you make the playoffs 13 years in a row, uh, I think you fall inevitably into some, maybe not inevitably, but it's, it's, it's very hard not to fall into a trap of we've always done it this way. So therefore it must be right. And the league is changing and the league is evolving uh, around us. Um, you know, if you look at the number of young players that feature uh, for really good teams, um, it is simply an essential part of, uh, of being a successful club uh, in, in MLS now and in, in the modern league. And that's something that we have to get better at. And we know that. Um, and we have to continue to find ways to incorporate that on a first team level. And we have to continue to reinforce our structures. You know, we've had the same group of players in place largely for most of this run. I mean, certainly since 2018, when we signed Raul Ruiz Diaz, um, you know, and I guess in 20, we had JP, you know, we've, we've kind of been able to add a player a year, but the core has largely been the same. Um, and again, I think that can lead to some complacency, uh, some so it looks some satisfaction. We went out and we won Champions League and nobody had ever been in that situation before about, hey, you know, effectively you've worked for, you know, a, a year and a half to get to that point and you win that game. And again, I don't think our talent fell off because, again, we, we, we were pretty good uh, for a month and a half after that. Uh, but then I do think we got a little fatigued. I do think that we got a little complacent. And I think that's what uh, some of what Nico's referring to. And so we're going to take a hard look at our structures, um, our player usage, and see if we can come up with some better solutions, um, especially knowing that, that uh, you know, culturally, at least, I think the group is going to be largely the same uh, going into next year. Next question, we'll go over to Maz Vida. Maz, go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, Garth, just and I know there's there's a piece of this that Brian, obviously you and Brian have a discussion on, but just the balance of bringing up young players and giving them the opportunity to learn and grow, and yet with the expectation, obviously, of getting back in the playoffs and not just getting in the playoffs, as we all know what you all, your expectations are, but, you know, getting back to playing for that final, just that balance that you have to really evaluate in the off season and then make come to fruition during the season yeah look some of it's bounce Maz, but some of it's not like uh philadelphia's in the final in the west in the east final right uh dallas was in the you know just lost in uh a nail biter uh to get knocked out so these are clubs that are historically all youth or mostly youth players right um you know you've seen in the last couple of years i think rsl's had uh, I think they've won more playoff games than we have. It's another club that's been historically, you know, youth oriented. So um, again, LAFC, a, a club as, that's done pretty well, uh, routinely playing young players. So I think that's an old argument a little bit, like you have to weigh winning with playing young players. And I think that's actually what's one of the things that's really important that we get past. And we have to understand that the young players um, can be a foundation of our success. You know, especially when you're talking about uh, potentially having four or five starters, uh, again, over the age of 30, uh, then you need to look at things like, hey, in a three game week, are we going to rotate the group? You know, you've heard me talk about here in this space before, are we going to use nine plus two, eight plus three lineups, meaning eight of the, you know, the of the uh, established starters and, and three of the of the youngsters? Um, it, just to keep everybody fresh and to keep everybody uh, on the same page and to get the maximum outputs we can from everyone. And so, um, it, you know, for sure, uh, there is some balance there, you know, but if you look, if you look at our season, really what I think we're talking about balance wise is go back to last year, Moz, we play five teenagers against Austin, we win. Um, on July 2nd, we played nine uh, under 23 players against Toronto, we win. Um, you know, even uh, as we go later in the season, you know, this, you know, in the midst of 
a period where we just weren't able to answer the bell at the end of the season. Uh, when we played eight uh, kids against Cincinnati, we get a draw, and that was probably the highest energy we had in the last two months. So, um, give me one second, guys. There's a balance right there. <laughs> That's awesome. I'll buy some time by saying that is an incredible cameo appearance. I believe that's a first, uh, but you know what, Garth? I, I invited I, Sam to join, but uh, Sam Sam's a little shy, so uh, I'm sorry, I don't know who that was. So, Do you <laughs> mind letting us know? Just that. Uh, thank you guys for understanding. Uh, this is the world I live, for better or worse. So um, <laughs> I, I think I had rambled enough in my answer too. So maybe Sam was maybe that was a, a an omen that would that uh, he gave was long enough on the topic. So, so Garth, it, I guess the the next one to that is then just how important is it to to, to get that right? Just in terms of that the uh, the evaluation of the talent to get it. Yeah, right. yeah. And sorry, right. just to try to finish that thought, you know, rather than I, where I was going, Mosque, I didn't ask the question. Was hey, instead of playing eight or nine of the young kids together, where where now you really may be at an overall talent deficit relative to your uh, best eight, nine, eleven guys. Um, again, are there ways to mix them in in a systemic process based way where now they're playing more and you're, you and the group is better off um, because you're you're uh, not riding the, the older players for as many minutes. Um, and so now you're getting the dual benefits of development, but you're doing it in a way that um, doesn't have a big impact uh, on competition. Uh, and again, I think, you know, you're talking about getting better performances on both sides of the ledger, fewer minutes for the older guys. But also, and this is the, the, the just the fundamental thing, young players almost always get better. Uh, that is the nature of being 19, you know, and, and if you go back to learning how to drive a car or, or ride a bike or, you know, like if you do it a hundred times, you're probably better than the, once you do it, you know, the first seven or eight times. So I just think it's it's embracing stuff like that and understanding that, um, you know, I, I, I you know, on, on a, when we get into evaluations, we tend to get hung up on negatives. So if a player makes a mistake, then we, you know, we single that out. We say, hey, we can't have that mistake. But the reality is that veteran players make mistakes at nearly the same rate that young players do. We just are more attuned and we're more sensitive to it in young players because maybe the, the you know, the potential is there, but the ceiling isn't yet there. Uh, and I think, that, again, that's part of adjusting our, our thinking going forward, uh, where we embrace the idea that young players are almost universally going to get better um, particularly uh, when shown uh, confidence systemically, you know, over the course of a, uh, an entire season. Thanks. All right. Next question, go over to Felipe Makeda. Felipe, go ahead. Felipe, you're muted. Still muted. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you, Alex. You said that you're going to bring uh, another players from Tacoma Defiance. And um, facing the, uh, the this big tournament, international tournament, what is the plan in terms of roster uh, of players for the roster to for the, uh, uh, the World uh, Clubs Cup? Yeah, we unfortunately we still don't know, Felipe. Um, the it was a, we understand it was a topic that was discussed uh, at the most recent FIFA conference, uh, but that no decisions have been made. So, so we you know we believe that it's going to be uh, in early February, uh, but we don't have hard dates uh, and we don't have a location. So it is still uh, impossible for me to answer questions about transfer windows and player registration and things like that, other than to say, you know, I do think the tournament is going to happen. And I don't think those things will be very different than what they are ahead of an MLS season. I think you're going to have, you know, roughly the same number of players. Um, you know, if you're talking about a February window, um, that means that we'll have been able to, you know, probably the window won't have been open very long, but obviously we're in the process of evaluating players right now as we speak, you know, started as soon as the season ended. Uh, and, you know, as always, we, we're going to wait and get the best deals and we're not going to compromise anything, uh, you know, in terms of solely focusing on a couple games in February. We're going to look at the, the the full extent of the, you know, very likely 40 to 45 games we're going to play next year. 
Um, but, you know, yes, we're looking at new players and looking at opportunities. And, and I do think that we will have uh, one or two things uh, come through the door of this window. Thank you. Okay, reminder, if you have a question for Garth, go ahead and hit that raise hand function button. I do see there are a few follow-ups, and that's totally fine. We'll go to Ari next, though, for his first time question. Ari, go ahead. Hey, Garth. Uh, thanks for the time. Uh, Two-parter for me. Uh, the first one uh, is, uh, do you have any update on uh, Jao Paulo's status, just how he's doing with his rehab, and is your impression at this point that he's on track to be ready to go for preseason? And then second, just on the topic of the Club World Cup, I know you said you don't know the details, but um, just what are you anticipating the you know ex in excitement level of getting to uh, play in and compete in that event uh, for the organization? Thanks. Yeah, I mean, look, the Club World Cup, I think, speaks for itself in the sense of, you know, this is, uh, we kind of made a big deal about winning Champions League. I don't know if you saw the guys dropping the things from the planes and the fireworks and the singing and the, all that. So, uh, you know, yeah, man, we're going to go for it in the Club World Cup. And I think it's going to be awesome. And, you know, came up from a number of the players in the postseason meetings at how excited they are to play in that. So I do think that is a monumental event. And I don't mean to make light of that by just saying we don't have a schedule, but we, we don't have a schedule. So we, uh, until we get a schedule, we can't plan our preseason. And, you know, there's just some logistical stuff we gotta, gotta climb over, but it'll, that stuff will come and, uh, and we will get fired up about it. And, um, you know, it's, it's a lot, it's really something that everyone is looking forward to, um, and with a sense of, of optimism and hope and excitement. And, um, so, so that'll be a good thing. Um, in terms of JP and, uh, I know you didn't ask about Obed, but he's on a somewhat parallel track, uh, Andrew Thomas is a little bit behind those two guys, um, but uh, Obed and JP are on a track where they uh, they could make it for the Club World Cup again without hard dates, without uh, hard timelines. I think it's hard to say yes or no, and and we're too far out as well too. Uh, you know, you're talking about still uh, something that's four months away. So um, you know they are making good progress. Uh, they're on schedule, um, and you know we've done enough of these rehabs, unfortunately. Uh, between Will Bruin and Jordan and Nico and and uh, I might be missing one other ACL we've had, but um, you know we're, we've got these pretty dialed. Roman Torres, I think it was the other one I was thinking of. You know, so unfortunately we've had a number of these, so uh, we do have it pretty well dialed in at this point. And um, again, JP's a uh, really hard worker, uh, just a really good pro, and uh, he's doing everything he can uh, to be available. And you know, again, he's somebody where I think he's got a couple good years of this left, and and we're not gonna jeopardize uh, that time, you know, in order to rush him back for um, one or two games in February. Uh, but certainly that's the goal. Uh, and uh, that's our ambition. All right. I see a few follow-ups. And if you also have additional follow-ups out there, please go ahead, hit that raise hand function button. We'll go back to the top of the order. Nico Moreno, go for it. Uh, or right, Garth, uh... Two good questions. Uh, one, uh, Jimmy Medrand is one of those guys that went healthy, uh, seemed to give you something different at the left back position. Uh, he's out of contract. Is there any intent or uh, do you think that you'll be reaching out to him or is that kind of just done in, and over with Jimmy? Had good conversations with Jimmy. You know, he wants to explore the market, um, which is he's earned. You know, he's, he's he has that right. That's how the system's designed for. Um, but to be clear, I think it'll be a collaborative process. You know, I think he'll look around and, and we're, we're exploring our options. And um, the one thing I would say, uh, Nico, is for me, uh, I thought Jimmy was more effective this year in advanced positions. Uh, meaning, uh, you know, more left wingery than left back, uh, to not use English words, but, uh, you know, just, uh, he was, I thought he was pretty dynamic at times in attack and, and, uh, uh, you know, not quite as successful at times in, in the back. So, um, that might be something that we, we tweak how we deploy him, how we look at him. Uh, but to be clear, the honest answer is that one is totally up in the air and, and depends on some stuff that's out of our control. Um, but, but again, it's been an amicable, uh, relationship and, and, uh, we'll be in touch and we'll see what happens. And I wanted to ask you about, uh, Yamar Gomez Andrade, you, uh, extend his contract uh, he gets a bump, a huge bump on his pay. He's uh, uh, the Sanders haven't had a center back that consistent in terms of minute and that dominant in terms of stats back to back uh, leading the league in interceptions and uh, top 10 in terms of a, a whole lot of other statistics. Um, so, you know, 
what has that been and how important is that for you to build on by having a, a pillar uh, in that center back position? You look, I, you know, I, I, look, Yamar has been great, right? And, uh, you know, uh, defender of the year, or runner up uh, two years ago. Um, and then what I would say with him is, and with any player now uh, crossing that threshold of 30 is, is it, it, they have to work even harder to stay healthy because, you know, little things can trip them up. And again, to his credit, I think he played in some pain for us in the Champions League, you know, when he wasn't 100%. And, and he gave it, he gave us some really big performances. And and that's a credit to him. Uh, but that's, it's just true that, uh, you know, that, that fitness aspect is going to be crucial for his longevity uh, going forward. But yeah, he's he's great. He's a great character. Um, his athleticism is some of the top in the league. Um, I think he's actually worked on his passing as well um, and gotten better at that. The coaching staffs work closely with him on that. So yeah, I think he's a great piece for us. Um, you know, but look, one of the things that we got to look at, Nico, is that back line is basically the same group that was, I think, second in the league a year ago uh, in terms of goals, right? If you look at Alex and Nuhu and Javi and and uh, Yamar. Um, granted in the back five some of the time uh, but and again in Champions League to be clear I think we were the top defense I, I, I'll maybe check that for me but we were very good in defense in the Champions League you were. Um, and you know and, and we had uh, you know to the CONCACAF best 11 uh, knew who and Javi named uh, to that to that uh, group so you know best some of the best players on the on the continent at that point um, but yet we weren't, so we, you know, seemingly weren't able to replicate that in MLS. So we do have to unpack that and try to, again, try to have a, a systemic analysis as to, again, this is, we know these players are good. Um, now, how do we uh, get the group as a whole uh, to be consistently and reliably uh, at that standard where they were uh, in the 21 season and during the Champions League in, in 22? Okay, Jeremiah, go ahead. Uh, I would assume that you've started doing some of this analysis already, that it's not like you're starting now um, looking at some of the systemic problems. Is there anything that you, I don't know, that you that you feel like you have gotten your hands around at this point? Uh, you mentioned maybe needing to rotate uh, with younger players a little bit more, but was there anything uh, beyond uh, fitness and 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 that kind of thing? Look, I, I think, yeah, I mean, yes, it, uh, Jeremiah, your, your observation is correct that we have we are a little further along than maybe I have led to believe, but some of that stuff has to do with locker room and, and that'll stay internal. Um, and again, that's not to suggest that we had issues in the locker room. Um, what I'm saying is we may structure some things differently in terms of the day-to-day -day, uh, interactions with players. Um, and there's some things that we, we may tweak structurally in terms of how we interact as a staff um, and how we go forward on some of that. So I, so I can't share all those things, but yes, to be clear thematically, I do think if you take a super talented group and you have, you know, that's one that made history, won the Champions League, uh, and yet has played, uh, I think you quoted this in one of your articles, I think, we, I think we're below 500 since September of 2021, you know, that is concerning. So uh, we need to address that. And, uh, you know, one of the assets that we have, if you look at, uh, again, uh, under, I think it was under 23 player minutes, we finished fourth, uh, fourth lowest in the league. You'd say, okay, well, we, you know, we have these players that appear to do pretty well for us, at least in certain situations. Now, can we leverage that and can we use those more often in an effort to achieve consistency? Because again, our problem based on our outcomes has not been talent it's been consistency. So how do you get to that consistency? Um, you know, that's the, that's the working hypothesis that I think that there is more we can do with our young players um, to work them into the group, uh, to rely upon them uh, and to help, help the group have success as a whole over uh, what will be a, a large number of games. Because remember, I shouldn't say remember, but one of the things that is true, you know, based on this year, we played 43 games, right? And, and, it felt like a lot, uh, but that is the new normal. Uh, when you look at a League's Cup competition, the Club World Cup, the Open Cup, in addition to the regular season and hopefully the playoffs, you know there are scenarios where you could play 60 games. Um, now, I think that's highly unlikely, and I think it's going to be more normal to play 40 to 45, um, but that is what we played this year. So 
if we have fatigue was one of our issues this year, um, then we do have to, it, it, the only, maybe not the only solution, but again, it's a pretty logical solution that we would then need to use more players in order to manage more games on a regular basis. And so I do think that that is uh, going to be uh, a core finding of ours in terms of how we move forward uh, as a club. Felipe, did you have a follow-up or are you good? Yes, I do. I do. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. So, Garth, um, last season, um, even if the team wasn't uh, doing good at the stadium, the fans still um, showing, even though it, it was a competition for fans, it was the Mariners, it was the rain, but the fans still coming to the stadium, even to the last uh, game. What can you tell me about that? And uh, the second question is, um, can you give us an update on what what's uh, the status of the uh, new facilities? Well, Felipe, thank you for that question. Uh, and and uh, first off, congratulations to the Mariners and congratulations to the Rain. Both of them had great seasons. It was really really fun, especially to see the big crowd that the Rain got. Uh, and and look, the the great crowd that sat in the pre pristine air for uh, uh, eighteen innings or whatever it was with the Mariners in the playoffs. So. Um, it, it's really fun to be in a place where all these teams are friends and friendly with one another. And um, it's fun to see those teams succeed. Um, and to your question, Felipe, we are really grateful for our fan base. They are incredible. Um, I still maintain that that uh, the Champions League final was the, the greatest sporting moment of my life. Um, you know, when the flashlights come on after the second goal, uh, and then, uh, you know, the, the earthquake sensors are being tripped and then we score the third goal and, you know, uh, you, you would have thought the building might collapse. So, uh, you know, it, it, our fans are amazing. They are inspiring um, and they are very much a source of why we are successful. Um, uh, you know, again, we have owners that are willing to reinvest uh, the proceeds of the club uh, into the team's success. And so we are very fortunate on the management side to have those resources. But, you know, by the fans showing up, by the fans supporting us, you know, rest assured that that is literally going directly into uh, the team's success. And, and that's what's allowing us to, you know, again, if Seattle's the 11th biggest city or whatever we are in the in the country, um, you know, we have resources in excess of that. And the reason we have that is because of our fans. Um, and look, some of those resources are also getting pushed into the training facility. And, and we are so excited about this. It's such a cool project. Um, we are on pace to open in 2024. And uh, again, we, we are you know working on uh, partners to, to join us in that endeavor uh, from the corporate standpoint. Um, and we could have some announcements on that front, uh, potentially by the end of the year. Um, but we are, it's just going to be a paradise, a wonderland, uh, you know, to have our own place um, and to have, you know, a number of fields that we control, to have a building that we control, um, uh, and it's just state of the art and top class. Um, it's, it's just going to be great. I think it's going to be a game changer for our, our club. I think it's going to transform what we're able to do day to day. Um, and we're just really looking forward to, um, you know, having one more, one more year at Starfire and then, uh, and then transition over to Long Acres and really enjoying and reveling in what, what that is and, and what, what, what will be coming. Because one of the key things about it is it will be accessible to the fans, just like Starfire's been. And, uh, hopefully our fans will be able to come there and, and share that great experience with us. Thank you. Thanks for your question, Felipe. Okay, working on the list. We'll go over next to Jada for her follow-up. Jada, go ahead. Thanks. Um, Garth, I just wanted to get a little bit more background on what you were saying as far as uh, the young players and utilizing loans more with them. Um, you know, can you explain a little bit more with that? And then also with um, some of the, like New Who uh, was one that was talked about as far as loans and, and uh, Javi. Uh, you know, where would that kind of play into some of the off-season uh, roster movement? Yeah, so let me tackle the last one first. So, you know, we have four players that we that could play in the World Cup. You know, knew who uh, looks likely with Cameroon, Javi looks likely with Ecuador, uh, and we're certainly hopeful. Uh, and I'd like to say that Jordan and Christian look likely for the for the United States. 
Um, and as they go into the World Cup, it's the biggest tournament in the world. Uh, it's the biggest platform. And obviously, if they have performances that are, uh, you, know, you know, the same level as they played with the Sounders, then um, there could be uh, some some uh, some opportunities for them. Um, so, uh, that's something that we'll evaluate if that comes to pass. And, um, you know, on the top end of our roster, I think that's the kind of stuff we're talking about in terms of, you know, could you, could we transfer a player? Yeah, it's, it's possible, but, uh, it's important to remember too, that those transfers have to be mutual. You know, that's not just a Sounders decision. That's up to the player. Uh, is that something they want to do? Is there a place that they want to go? Um, and with respect to the loans, I think we're just talking about numbers of players coming through now uh, that grows every year. Um, and so we had some success loaning uh, Ethan out uh, a year earlier. Um, we had some success loaning Soda Kitahara out, um, you know, a, a defiance player. Um, and so, uh, you know, we had some success this year with Sam Adinaran going out on loan and um, you know, I, what I would say is in the past, those things haven't always been as successful. And so we've been, let more reluctant to dip our toe in those waters. And all I would say is I think going forward, we're going to be more uh, potentially more proactive in terms of trying to find solutions for our young players um, to get uh, on-field opportunities, because especially those kids that are playing for youth national teams, um, they often are known uh, pretty well around, you know, in, in Europe uh, and in other countries. And I think that's something that maybe we could improve on uh, by giving some of those young kids uh, some more opportunities. All right. Maz, did you have a follow-up? I do. Um, hey, Garth, I know halfway somewhere during the season, the practice kind of the intensity or the interval was changed. Um, I know there's a part that each season you look at that. Do, it, do you all now have a pretty good idea after evaluating that going into the preseason now, kind of what what to tweak and how to, how that's going to go. You're not going to tell us, but I'm just, I know that was a something that you all looked at and changed. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that that was in response to, again, just, just the, I think, not, not, I don't want to say the shock, but you know, we had a big load in the first half of the year. Right. And, and so we had to manage that loading uh, as we entered the back half of the season, but look, I think it's important to acknowledge that, you know, uh, the tweaks that we made, it allowed us to field healthy players but I don't think we were playing our best, Moss. You know, I, I I thought for the first time, you know, if you look at some of the numbers and you say, uh, you know, I think we I think it was Alex, Jeremiah, you can help me, but I think we had nine times we, we had a lead where we didn't win. Uh, yeah, 15, goal 15 one goal losses. You know, those are some very unsounders like numbers, not typical for what we've been and, and who we are. And again, I think you have to look at that and say, you know, uh, look at the performances when we absolutely had to win at Vancouver, at Kansas City to stay alive. And we couldn't respond. And I, I don't believe for a second that the guys didn't want to respond or that they, they you know, they weren't given their maximum effort. Uh, I, I know that they were. Um, but for whatever reason, we couldn't answer the bell at the most urgent times, uh, at the most critical point of the season. And I, I do think that we need to look, you know, and again, to be clear, we are looking at how do you uh, approach a season with 40 to 45 games um, in, and train players in a manner that is not just intended to keep people on the field, but is intended to make a greater number of players uh, resilient and available? Uh, because, I, again, I, I don't think we can repeat the same process and with the number of players that we used over 43 games. I think we have to have more players involved in order to navigate the number of games that we are going to play next year and all the years going forward during the world cup uh, what's that like for you i mean hey there's a gm part of it there's a former player there's a fan like what what's that like for you oh, look i'm going to be rooting for the u.s right that, that'll be yeah, fun yeah, yeah. And, and and uh you know greg burhalter and i were teammates on the uh immortal uh raleigh flyers in 1995 and you know so there's little tidbits like that he was the only field player i ever played with the talk more knighted if you can even imagine such a thing. Um, so, uh, you know, I'll be rooting for, you know, Craig's my friend and I grew up with Brian McBride uh, in the Chicago suburbs and we're the same age. And, you know, so we got some personal connections there uh, to the staff and, um, uh, you know, obviously with Jordan and Christian, hopefully both on the team, you got, there's a lot going on, right? And, and to have four players in the World Cup. I mean, that's, I, I don't know that many clubs in the world that maybe have four clubs. I mean, I'm sure there are other ones, but, you know, at least within MLS, 
I don't think there are going to be many teams that have four players that, that play in the World Cup. So um, really proud of that. Really proud of those guys. And, and I'll be rooting for them. And, and I think that what's going to be fun for me, Maz, is, is watching games as a fan, um, you know, to not have the stress of this doesn't affect our playoff stakes at all. Uh, but, man, it's fun to sit back and, and uh, you know, have a stiff cup of coffee because I think some of those games are on pretty early in the morning. And, uh you know, uh, enjoy the games and enjoy the tournament, enjoy the pageantry. And, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a good moment for soccer. And and if you look at that world cup and, you know, the next one's coming to Seattle, coming to the United States, that's a really cool thing. You know, that's, that's hopefully transformative for our league and our sport going forward. Thanks guys. Appreciate it. Not sure how many of you had the Raleigh flyers on your bingo card, but if you <laughs> did, uh, full credit to those of you that, that know about that one. I, I learned something today. Um, all it's right. The, it's the same group that had the Bears scoring 33 points last night on the road in Foxborough. Okay. All right. There we go. Uh, Jeremiah, I see your hand. Go for it. Uh, I, I will note that uh, I was very surprised by both the Bears scoring uh, 33 points on the road <laughs> and this tidbit about Greg Berhalter and you being teammates for the Raleigh Flyers. Um, That's a good one. But, yeah, uh, that said, um, we haven't seen an announcement with the defiance. Um, I don't know if you, Marlon Vargas mentioned or made it pre, implied that he's, he's not coming back next year. Is there any other, uh, can you speak to that? And then any other sort of, uh, roster moves that might, might be going on with the defiance? Yeah. And, and look, Jeremiah, we, we, uh, I may be clear my fault, uh, we, that we have not gotten this out in a more expedited fashion. So we owe you guys that. And, and those look, all those decisions have been made. We've met with all the players. Um, that's a matter of, uh, getting our ducks in a row and, and getting that stuff out to you. So we'll, we'll try to do that certainly by the end of this week. I don't think there's a ton of mystery there. Um, uh, it is correct that Marlon will not be coming back. Um, I think, uh, if you look at the history uh, of that position on that team. Uh, we've had a number of players that have actually been pretty good there, but the jump up to the first team is Nico Ladero and Albert Rusnak. And it's tough for a guy in defiance to come in and, and, and play at that level. And it's, it's a position that we're probably always going to spend big money on. Uh, and so again, uh, Marlon's a guy who's been in our system for a number of years. Great kid. Um, I think he's going to have a very successful career somewhere. Um, and, you know, the best thing to do, uh, I think, was be to give him a chance uh, somewhere else. And obviously we'll support him and we'll recommend him and uh, we'll help you and help him explore those opportunities. But, you know, as you've heard me say in other settings, uh, Jeremiah, you know, I think uh, we were talking about Ray Serrano a year ago. Um, you know, I think a big part of our success in player development has been our willingness to, to, to view these players as, as humans and as kids and be willing to help them with their careers and their path as, as uh, people as much as, uh, you know, prospects for the Sounders. All right, Jada, I see your hand up for another follow-up. Go for it. Yeah, uh, I wanted to ask about the Starfire next year with the um, rain moving in. How does that kind of work on your end, um, you know, as far as, uh, I guess, sharing space or what can you kind of explain about how the logistics will work? I don't know that we know everything for sure, Jada. You know, it's one of those things until it happens. Uh, you know, I think it's all hypothetical. Um, obviously, we'll do everything we can to accommodate the rain and, and to help them out. Um, but ultimately, it's not our building. You know, we are we are tenants in, at Starfire, uh, the same as uh, the rain will be tenants at Starfire. So um, my understanding is they'll have a, a separate field that will be dedicated to them. Um, and beyond that, uh, you know, I'm not sure. You know, we're, you know, we will be in the same footprint that we've been in all along. So I don't think any of our day-to-day -day stuff will change. Um, and obviously, uh, hopefully, uh, Starfire is able to accommodate uh, the rain uh, to the best manner possible and, and give them the best chance to succeed going forward. Nico Moreno, you're the last hand I'm seeing. Did you have another one? Uh, yeah, uh, two quick ones. One, I mean, Garth, we've talked about Got a cough. Uh, you, you're one of the best. Obviously, there's a job opening. It seems like your name could be right up. DC United just happened. Uh, you know, how comfortable are you uh, where you are? And, you know, is there anybody coming for Garth at this point in time? 
Look, I've had uh, we got we, again. We're getting ahead of ourselves, Nico, because we still have the the fan vote that has to be announced in terms of uh, whether or not the fans want me back. And right. um, so you got the GM vote, and then once you have the GM vote announcement, my understanding is that's going to come in. I think in mid November. I think it'll be announced at the uh, annual business meeting. So we're a couple weeks away from that, um, and then. Obviously, there'll be a Sounders piece where the Sounders decide, hey, you know, is this something we want to do? And, and again, those those conversations have always been amicable and friendly and and positive and, you know, no reason to doubt, uh, you know, any of those things. And then ultimately, it's it's up to me to to make a decision with my family and and uh, see what's best for, you know, the next, you know, 10, 15 years. You know, hopefully in this business, you can go another 15 years and, you know, it's it's uh, it's longer term decisions and. Um, you know, it's been uh, and, and continues to be uh, amazing here in Seattle. I, I don't know how you could ever uh, have a fan base that is more supportive of a team. Um, it is a, a privilege and a pleasure uh, to be a steward of this club. And um, again, we'll we'll get to the end of everything here and we'll we'll figure out what happens next. But uh, either way, uh, I'm certainly grateful uh, for the first eight years and and uh, we'll see what happens next. All Thank right, you. Final, call, final call for questions. If anyone has one, hit that raise hand function button. Going once. Okay, and just a couple of closing notes from us. As Garth mentioned, that Tacoma Defiance roster update, we will likely have that out by end of week, so stay tuned there. There will be more information on the club's annual business meeting coming out uh, this week, so keep your eyes peeled for that one. Uh, there is the ability, as always, for media to be on site to cover that. You are all welcome. Um, and lastly, the MLS expansion draft coming up not too far away now on November 11th. Um, so just a heads up there before the FIFA World Cup starts in Qatar, November 20th. Garth, do you have any closing remarks? Uh, just thank you all. Um, I know uh, we had some uh, trials and tribulations getting through COVID, uh, not just uh, this group, but society as a whole. And we're, we're kind of now finally getting back to normal. And um, I appreciate uh, you guys being with us through thick and thin and um, obviously uh, a big moment with Champions League, but uh, probably not as much fun to cover us uh, the, the second half of the season. So uh, we appreciate uh, you sticking with us. We appreciate you guys. I think have always given us the benefit of the doubt. Um, not every press corps does that. Um, and so we are really grateful for that. And, and uh, we like to think we've, we've earned some goodwill uh, along the way here. Um, but we're going to do our best uh, to get right back up on the horse and get back in playoff contention and uh, start winning things in, in 2023 again.